Dr. Thomas Engber um, of Disarm Therapeutics, uh, where he serves as Senior Vice President and the Head of Pharmacology. Uh, his talk will be Presenting Axonal De Degeneration in ALS by Inhibiting SARM-1. Thomas. Okay, just uh, you. getting my presentation up. Okay, you see my slides? Yes, we do. Great. Thank you. One. So first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to discuss our SARM-1 inhibitor program today. Um, so Disarm Therapeutics has uh, discovered the first SARM-1 inhibitors, um, and we are now a wholly owned subsidiary of Eli Lilly and Company. So I'm going to start out by giving you a brief background on SARM-1 and then discuss the rationale for SARM-1 as a therapeutic target in ALS. And then I'll show some of the preclinical data that we've generated with our SARM-1 inhibitors. So SARM-1 is the central driver of axonal degeneration, and axonal degeneration is believed to underlie the symptoms of many neurodegenerative disorders. Uh, so there are a variety of different pathogenic triggers that can activate SARM-1. These can be immunoinflammatory, mitochondrial dysfunction, traumatic, metabolic dysfunction, toxins. All of these things activate SARM-1 enzymatic activity, and this leads to axonal degeneration. And axonal degeneration uh, is known to occur either in the absence of or substantially prior to neuronal cell body loss in a wide range of neurodegenerative disorders. And this can be uh, from ALS, MS, Parkinson's disease, glaucoma, and peripheral neuropathies. So the hypothesis is that by inhibiting SARM-1, we'll provide a disease-modifying therapeutic benefit by preventing pro progressive exonal loss. So SARM-1 uh, is, is key to the, uh, initiating the process of programmed exonal degeneration. And this is regulated by the interaction between SARM-1 and NMNAT2. NMNAT2 is an NAD synthesizing enzyme uh, that's constitutively present in axons, as is SARM-1, but NMNAT2 is a very labile protein, so it has a half-life of about an hour inside of cells, so it needs to be constantly resupplied to the axon by axonal transport. And in healthy neurons, SARM-1 activity is held to very low levels. However, axonal injury reduces NMNAT2 transport, which leads to activation of SARM-1 enzymatic activity, resulting in NAD depletion, um, ATP loss, uh, energetic failure, calcium influx, calpane activation, and breakdown of the axon. And this breakdown of the axon uh, leads to, lot, to release of intracellular contents, including neurofilament light chain, a cytoskeletal protein which has emerged as a prominent biomarker of axonal degeneration in a wide range of neurodegenerative disorders, as we heard about yesterday for ALS. So it's a growing body of evidence that supports SARM-1 as a therapeutic target in ALS. And the first is uh, genomic evidence that it was um, uh, based on a GWAS study first published in uh, 2014 that identified SNPs in the locus containing SARM-1 on chromosome 17 as a risk factor for sporadic ALS. And this finding was later replicated in an independent GWAS study published in 2016. There's also emerging evidence that SARM-1 may be a downstream effector of TDP43 pathology. And there's really two lines of evidence for this. First is that SARM-1 deletion was shown to protect axons in a TDP43 transgenic mouse model. That's the figure shown at the bottom of left from the paper by White et al. 
showing that in the Q331K um, TDP43 transgenic mouse, there's a progressive loss of motor axons in the ventral roots shown in the middle set of panels there. And this progressive axonal loss is reduced in the SARM1 knockouts. The second line of evidence comes from the, the two papers that were published in Nature Neuroscience in 2019 that identified Staphman 2 as a key driver of TDP43 mediated degeneration in ALS. So the data shows there that Staphman 2 is dramatically downregulated when there's a loss of nuclear TDP43. But Staphman 2, also known as SCG10 in the literature, was previously described as a, as a suppressor of axonal degeneration that may work by inhibiting SARM1 activity. So it's known that reduced levels of either Staphman 2 or NMNAT2 in axons lowers the threshold for axonal degeneration. And as shown on the graphs on the bottom right, uh, levels of both Staphman 2 and NMNAT2 protein have been shown to be reduced in postmortem ALS spinal cord. So both of these axon survival factors play a role in suppressing the activity of SARM-1 and anything that decreases their levels, and these are both very labile proteins that need to be constantly resupplied. So if you interfere with axonal transport, or as in, the, in ALS, where decreased nuclear TDP-43 decreases Staphman-2 levels, you lower the threshold for SARM-1 activation. And this then leads to uh, SARM-1 activity, uh, NADase activity, loss of NAD, and axonal degeneration. So it's also recent data that directly implicates SARM-1 variants in, or directly links SARM-1 variants to ALS. So this is unpublished data that we generated with Sally Farhan at the Broad Institute. Um, and here she did a search of genomic databases and found that protein truncation variants in SARM-1, which result in loss of function, were identified at a nine-fold higher rate in healthy controls than in ALS patients. So that's the data shown in the table. We're out of about 180,000 non-ALS cases. There were 181 cases with the SARM-1 protein truncation variants. However, out of the 9,000 ALS cases examined, there was only a single case with a SARM-1 protein truncation variant. Conversely, there were several potential SARM-1 gain-of-function variants that were identified in ALS patients, but not in normal controls. And then two papers have recently been published showing that SARM-1 gain-of-function variants are candidate risk genes for ALS. So these two groups independently identified um, SARM-1 gain-of-function variants that were enriched in ALS patients versus controls. These gain-of-function variants were both missense and deletion variants, uh, and they're shown to be constitutively active. So when you express these variants in cells, you get a rapid loss of NAD, whereas if you express wild-type SARM-1, there's no effect on NAD because it's constitutively held in an inactive state. These variants were almost entirely located in the auto-inhibitory arm domain of SARM-1, the domain shown in blue on the bottom. The uh, constitutively active variants are shown in red along the top. All but one was in this auto-inhibitory ARM domain. And it's known that the ARM domain plays a critical role in suppressing the NADase activity, which is located in the tier domain of SARM-1, shown in green here. Now, when one of these variants, uh, V184G, uh, was expressed in mouse spinal cord via intrathecal injection of an AAV vector, they showed that this led to motor neuron degeneration. Again, making the case that these SARM-1 gain-of-function variants are candidate risk genes for ALS. So at DISARM, we've been um, developing SARM-1 inhibitors for the treatment of ALS and other neurodegenerative disorders. So we've discovered potent, selective, orally available, blood-brain barrier penetrant inhibitors of SARM-1. These were initially identified as HITS, via high throughput screening in a SARM-1 NADase assay. We've optimized for activity in vitro in the dorsal root ganglion exotomy model, and also optimized for PK ADMI characteristics. We demonstrate the activity of our SARM-1 inhibitors in human iPSC-derived motor neurons, and we also demonstrated in vivo efficacy in an acute injury model, a sciatic nerve transection model in, in mice. 
And throughout our, our preclinical in vitro and in vivo studies, we've tried to employ translatable biomarkers and in particular used NFL as a pharmacodynamic biomarker of exonal degeneration. So this is data from an in vitro dorsal, uh, mouse dorsal root ganglion uh, study. And on the top, you see the uh, axons of these DRG neurons that are stained for beta-3 tubulin. On the left panel are the control axons, an uninjured state. The middle is what is the typical fragmentation pattern. You see a distal to a cut injury of the axon. So this is the typical Wallerian degeneration fragmentation that occurs. And then on the right is, is the protection you see in the presence of a SARM-1 inhibitor, of this 3716 compound, where these axons are completely structurally intact and look just like the controls. And this is quantified in the graph at the bottom left. And so you can see in the wild type axons that are injured, and this is the red bar, 100% of the axons degenerate. Whereas either in the SARM-1 knockouts shown in the blue and the green bar, or in the, in the axons treated with the SARM-1 inhibitor, you can almost completely prevent this degeneration. So showing that our SARM-1 inhibitors are phenocopying the, the, uh, the SARM-1 knockout phenotype. And on the right, we showed that we can also measure this, this protective effect on axonal degeneration by uh, showing prevention of the release of NFL. So after this cut injury, there's release of NFL into the culture medium. And you can see here a dose-dependent prevention of NFL release by this 3716 compound with an EC50 of 1.9 micromolar. Very similar to what we see if we measure the axon degeneration uh, using imaging. This slide shows that we all get a similar protective effect of our compound on human iPSC-derived motor neurons subjected to this same cut injury. Again, on the left are the control axons, uninjured state. The middle panel is this typical fragmentation pattern after axonal injury. And then you see the protective effect of 3716 on the right. And this is quantified. We see the dose response for the protection with 3716 uh, in the graph on the far right. And we've shown the in vivo activity of these compounds in protecting axons in a mouse sciatic nerve transection model. Here we measure plasma NFL as a surrogate measure of axonal degeneration. And on the far left uh, graph, you can see in naive animals, uh, there's very low levels of plasma NFL. After the sciatic nerve transection in vehicle treated animals, the bars in red, you can see that there's a robust increase in plasma NFL levels. And then with three different SARM-1 inhibitors, we show that we get a dose-dependent prevention of this increase in plasma NFL. Um, all of these NFL levels were measured 15 hours after transection. So I, I've shown you we've discovered potent, selective, orally available blood-brain barrier penetrating inhibitors of SARM-1. We've been using NFL as a translatable biomarker of axonal degeneration. And really that we're now beginning to prepare to assess the efficacy in an ALS proof of concept study using clinical outcomes and biomarkers. As usual, we'll be using ALS FRSR as a primary endpoint. Um, we would like to use NFL certainly as a pharmacodynamic marker of axonal degeneration, potentially as a biomarker for stratification as well. And we also have additional biomarkers under consideration. And lastly, I'd just like to thank the members of the Disarm Therapeutics team who have been responsible for the tremendous progress that we've made in this program. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Um, really great progress uh, with that program. Nice to see. Um, I guess I, I have one question uh, before we start uh, accepting uh, some from, from the chat. Um, do we have a sense of what other roles SAR might have in other cell types? Um, have you looked into the implications of inhibiting it broadly? Yeah, so the highest levels of SARM-1 expression are in neurons. Uh, it is found in macrophages as well. Uh, in fact, it was originally uh, discovered as a toll receptor adapter protein. 
um, and thought to play a role in immune function. However, it really does not have a very prominent role in immune function. The initial knockouts that were generated um, did not really show very much effect. And immunologists kind of got bored with it. And it was kind of forgotten until its role in exonal degeneration was discovered. So there's not a very prominent role that's been discovered in tissues outside the nervous system. Thank you. Um, question from the chat. Um, SARM-1 inhibition does not alter disease outcome in the classic SOD1 G93A mouse model. Is there evidence that SARM-1-driven degeneration is specific for TDP43 pathology, perhaps via Statham-2 modulation? Do other ALS mutations or triggers activate SARM-1, like C9 or 72? Yeah, so um, as I showed, there is evidence that it may be a downstream effector of TDP43 pathology. Um, we believe that may occur partly through Statham-2, but also independently, because in the TDP43 transgenic model, there is no involvement of Staphman 2. The Staphman 2 cryptic exon is human specific. So it does get activated in the, in, by TDP43 pathology independent of Staphman 2. Uh, it did not show any effect in the SOD1 transgenic model, but again, that model does not work through TDP43 pathology. So yes, we, we think in ALS, it may be linked to TDP43 pathology. Uh, but as I said, there are also a variety of other pathogenic triggers that, that can activate SARM-1. We've not looked specifically at C9-ORF-72, but again, those patients typically have TDP-43 pathology, so we would expect that SARM-1 would be activated there. Thank you. Um, a couple more, I think. I think we have time. Um, do we know yet how the GWAS SNPs linked to SARM-1 affect SARM-1? Presumably, there's an impact on expression. Uh, has this been shown yet? No, this has not been demonstrated. And, and you know, to be fair, there are other genes in, in that locus that, that could be involved as well. So it certainly doesn't prove the involvement of SARM-1, but I think the more recent studies with the loss of function and gain of function mutations being linked to ALS provide stronger evidence than the GWAS does. And our last question of this session, um, is SARM-1 modified post-translationally? Uh, it's a good question, and it almost certainly is, and there have been some reports of post-translational modifications, but um, our scientific founders, Jeff Milbrand and Aaron D'Antonio, have looked at this, and uh, they really have not found very much that influences SARM-1 activity in terms of uh, post-translational modification. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank all of our presenters uh, from this morning's uh, first session. And I think, Jen, uh, we now go to a brief break. Is that